Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Asia Kamski from Tenjen. like, I saw a big poster, so I thought I'd come in, but I didn't actually know what it meant. Awesome. <laughs> you'll, you'll be a little lost, don't worry about it. Later on, we'll, we can catch you up. You know, dynamic schema, blah, 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 memory bound files, blah, blah, blah. Really awesome, easy to work with, lots of drivers. Yeah. Uh, how, how many people have been working with MongoDB, you know, for let's say more than a year? Two years? Anybody remember any version before 2.0? Anybody work with 1.8? 1.6? Oh, I feel really bad. We should have something. <laughs> that's hardcore. Yeah, that is hardcore. Yeah, that's actually before our time. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. scary. All right, well, so I wanted to talk a little bit about 2.6, which um, release candidate one is available right now. Um, which means, other than maybe some bug fixes, this is the release that's going to be generally available as 2.6.0. Anybody download and play with it yet? I found some bugs. You know, we had a bug contest where if you'd like file the best bug, you'd get like a thousand dollars and a free trip to MongoDB World or something like that. <laughs> um, I guess not. You know, not everybody raised their hand that they've been, you know, working with, with a bunch of versions. So I'm going to give a tiny little bit of history, and that kind of maybe will give you an idea of why some of the major changes that were made for 2.6, a lot of which are not actually necessarily visible to the end user. Right? A lot of the changes are under the hood to enable us to add more features, to enable us to improve things faster, add more functionality faster, and some of it's just to make the whole thing work better. So who knows what MongoDB, why MongoDB came into existence, or what Tengen, the company, was originally going to do. Anybody hear that story? You're going to be bored if you know. All right, well, I'll take some pictures. <laughs> so initially, um, our two co-founders got together and they wanted to build uh, like an app platform, an app hosting platform, kind of like Google Apps, but uh, it was before Google Apps, it was like early 2007. And the idea was that, you know, you, they provide, you know, the back end, the storage layer, and they decided they didn't want to use an existing relational database because they both had had problems kind of trying to scale a relational database easily, plus, if something is going to be a platform, you can't very well tell people, like, you have to tell us in advance what the schema is going to be. So, you know, there had to be a certain level of flexibility. So, they were just going to write their own storage layer. And a funny thing happened is, uh, you know, everybody was going, yeah, I don't know about this app platform, not really that interested. But this database thing you're writing, that, that sounds like something I really would like to try because we've also had problems, you know, scaling a relational database behind you know, some massive website, and we also like to integrate schema fast, so they said, oh, okay, sounds like everybody's interested in the database, so they dropped the other part of the project, and that storage layer that was going to back the app engine is what became MongoDB. So some of the ideas that work perfectly fine when something is a storage layer behind, you know, a platform, and it's not really visible as a database, don't necessarily work as well when it's something that a person downloads and then tries to use as a database, right? So who knows about the get last error, right? It's this idea that, you know, if you're writing an app and you send a bunch of stuff to the back end and then you go, okay, now tell me, you know, did it all succeed? How did it go? Any errors? And, you know, it's something that people don't really expect from a database, right? In a database, the, the fairly standard generic thing is you send something to the database and if it didn't like it, it tells you. Like it says, oh, sorry, I couldn't insert that because you know, it violated some constraint. And in that way, Mongo was different and it caused a bit of confusion to people, mainly because they download stuff and they'd assume that it works the same way that every other storage 
uh, engine they've ever used works. Um, so about I don't know, a year and a half, we changed the default in the drivers. So the drivers would now, you know, by default, use safe mode, and so they would query and tell you what happened um, with your request, your write request. But under the hood, it was still a write request and a get last error command that kind of went with it. So our goal, 2.6 and beyond, is to get rid of get last error because that way things will be a lot simpler, right? All write commands will get a response. If you want to do the old unacknowledged writes, you can still do that. So the response will be, yep, I sent the batch. Since you say unacknowledged, I don't care, you know, if I get anything back. Uh, but that way it simplifies a lot of things in the code for, for the implementation because you avoid the situation where something is sent to the server and you have to keep track of it because later on you might get a request that says, hey, tell me how that write request did. So from the point of view of a developer, if you've been using the driver and you just set, you know, which acknowledgement mode you want, right, acknowledged, replica acknowledged, journal acknowledged, unacknowledged, or depending on different data, nothing actually changes in the sense of how you do this. But What's under the hood is going to be in a lot of ways simplified. And that means that it allows us to implement a lot more things in a much more straightforward manner. And so one of the um, ch big changes for 2.6 is the wire protocol, right? The way that the driver talks to the server uh, is getting a bunch of new commands. There's going to be an update command, a, um, essentially write commands for inserts, updates, deletes that will allow you to send, let's say, a bunch of updates as a batch or bulk operation, where if you want to know what happened, you will get back information. Like if you say, okay, try all of them. <coughs> I don't care about like strict order. So don't, don't stop on error. Let's say all but three of them succeed. It'll then send you back these three didn't succeed. So it, it becomes a lot easier to kind of send operations in batches without worrying about losing the details about um, anything that might have gone wrong. And actually, just being able to send updates in batches is an improvement because you didn't used to be able to do that. You only used to be able to send updates, uh, inserts in, in batches. Uh, two other fairly major areas that got a complete rewrite. Um, one of them was the update, the whole update framework. and. You know how when, in the way Elliot says it, it's like, well, at the beginning, we didn't really know if anybody would be interested in a document database. So we just got something out there, and like people were really interested in. So then people say, oh, add all of these features, and you go, uh, um, wait, I want to rewrite this thing, because it turns out a lot of people are going to be using it. So, and in general, every few years, software needs to be rewritten, they say, either so the developers don't get bored, or, or so that you, know, you can use the latest, and greatest, coolest, neatest techniques. Um, but one of the things that it was the case is the code was fairly complex <coughs> and a new developer comes in to the kernel team, it would take them a while to kind of learn all of the code and if they wanted to add a new operator. So let's say that we want to have an update and we want to you know, add some operator that didn't used to exist. We, you know, the person would have to kind of spend quite a long time, maybe even a month, figuring out all the different places where they have to add new code. The new framework was written in such a way that a developer, a new developer at MongoDB, could add a new operator fairly easily. Right? There's like, here's the three places where you have to add something and make sure that this does the right thing. And so even though 2.6 only has a handful of new operators, it means that we will be able to add new operators very easily going forward, which is always good because Everybody always has their favorite operator that, that they want added. And the other part that we rewrote is the query, the whole kind of query engine. Everything from how we parse the query to how we choose which indexes to use. Now, who knows how many indexes a MongoDB query can use? One. One. And that is true up to 2.4. 2.6 will support what's called index intersection. 
So 2.6 will be able to use more than one index in a query. Now, a lot of times people go, oh, this is great. That means if I have a query on A and B, and before, like, I needed to figure out, like, how to do a compound index, now I can just have a query, you know, an index on A and an index on B, and it'll use both. And that is true, but keep in mind that a compound index that covers all of the variables, all of the fields that you're querying on, will always perform better, right? So if you're always querying on, you know, first name, comma, last name, last name, comma, first name, doesn't matter, you probably want to have an index on both fields, a compound index. But imagine that you have a system, I don't know, you have some I don't know, product catalog, right? And there's a lot of different products, and you have maybe 40, 50 different attributes. And you can barely have enough, you know, room to have an index on each one of them. And what if you want to allow querying on two, any two of them or any three of them, right? By the time you add every permutation of every index, it's like, oops, you can only have 64 indexes on a collection. Mm. Plus, do you guys know how the technique to use to allow an arbitrary number of attributes uh, in a document? So let's say like you're building a next Amazon site. And so you're going to have books and clothes and shoes and electronics, right? And so the number of attributes is gigantic. Maybe few hundred, right? What's that? Sparse. Well, a sparse index will, will mean that, you know, an index on each attribute will not be as big because it'll only index the documents that actually have the attributes set. But what if you don't know up front all the different attributes that you will have? This is actually a really powerful technique in the, in the document database, right? A document can have an array, right? It can be an array of attributes. And if the structure of each attribute is, if it's a document that has like a name value pair, name is the name of the attribute. So name is color, value is blue, right? And the next entry in that same array is name is size, value is extra large, right? So it's like the, each attribute is a generic object which has a name and a value. So now you can have one index, which is a compound index on attribute dot name, comma, attribute dot value. And that index can be used to search for any attribute. This is where whiteboard sometimes helps. <laughs> but I see people kind of like trying to visualize this, right? So if um, if each item has an array of these main value pairs, and you say, okay, give me all of the items that have color blue, name color, value blue. All right, I'm looking for attribute, which is the color of the thing, and the value, which is blue. So that index can be used to find all of the blue things, even if you didn't know up front that you were going to be tracking a color. right? If you're selling electronics, all of a sudden, you know, you've got different kind of TVs or displays, right? Anything you enter in as an attribute, you can search as long as, you know, you know what you want to search by the name of the attribute and a particular value. The trick is if you want to search for multiple attributes, the index can only be used for the first one. Oh, no. What if that first one is not very selective? Well... Here's the cool thing about index intersection. You can in in intersect that index with itself. So if I'm looking for everything that has name, color, value, blue, and also, you know, style or you know, designer, such, you know, name, designer, value, whatever, and a few others, right? Index intersection can be used to quickly find the item that has the, the intersection of all of those attributes that are matched. And they're all matched in the index. Oh. Yay. Okay, so a little, <laughs> little tutorial on how to implement uh, dynamic attributes in MongoDB. But by the way, dynamic attributes are hard. Uh, I've had to do them in relational, and they are extra hard in relational. Um, and with Mongo, the fact that you can have arrays and the fact that you can index arrays this way can really help. 
In 2.6, index intersection will help if you're searching for multiple attributes so that that technique becomes uh, a lot more powerful. Yes? Yeah, I have one question because uh, previously uh, the, the algorithm to determine which index should be used was uh, simply just to try them all and... Empirical, and, yes. Yeah, and... and uh, lazy, I like to call them lazy. Yeah, lazy and empirical. And uh, to simply mark which is better suited for a query like that. Uh, how does uh, how does the algorithm changes when uh, when we have the index intersection? So the the general approach is still empirical, right? Because the alternative is you have to keep statistics and kind of be able to calculate which index is likely going to be the best one, and then the statistics have to be updated, and then you get into the same kind of you know statistics thing that yeah that those of us who dealt with relational databases know. So. The approach is still the same, and that is, um, now, when you do a query in 2.4, mm -hmm. we don't run a query in parallel to try every index that exists. We only pick the indexes that are what we call candidate indexes, mm -hmm. right? So, and we also try a collection scan, just in case that's actually faster, because sometimes it is. <laughs> It's the same thing in 2.6, it's just that index intersection, again, there has to be good candidates to intersect. So if you're querying on you know, A and B, and there is a, and let's say I'm sorting on C, right? And there may be an index on B comma C, but it's like not really selective, and there's like a really selective index on just A, it might turn out that just querying, just using index on A, and then doing an in-memory sort of a small subset of results that it returns, might be much faster than using B comma C. And if, if that's faster than the part of B comma C even getting to any usable results, it, it's obviously going to win. But um, the way I understand it is we have certain knowledge within the system as to where index intersection may be helpful. And there it's tried. Uh, but it'll st if it's not as performant, right? if a single index gives you a result faster, that's, it just probably means that uh, one of the other index probably wasn't in RAM or something like that. Right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's still okay. empirical. There's, there's actually a discussion about you know, making the query optimizer more multifaceted in the future. I don't want to say sophisticated, but these are different approaches, mm -hmm. right? Um, when I first heard about how the query optimizer does it, right, you run all of the possible ways, and the one that gets the results first is the winner. It's like, well, how clever is that, right? I mean, aside from the fact that it might not be the winner always, right, because the distribution of data might change, and this is why we retry the different query plans periodically, but it's it's kind of genius, you know. It's like you know, there's a saying, um, was it necessity is a mother of invention? I say it's not necessity; it's laziness. Laziness is the mother of invention. You always want the lazy, smart person to get the problem because they'll figure out how to solve it with the least amount of work, which is usually the most efficient way, right? So, so it's kind of a, I I I really kind of like the the approach, so I hope we kind of keep the, the core of it, but I'm sure that improvements can be made in not unnecessarily, you know, trying the query plans if we know that they're not going to be as efficient, for example. Obviously, as we add support for different ways to use indexes, there'll be more things to try. Okay. Anybody want to ask anything? I have, anything? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, for example, we were using uh, PostgreSQL before MongoDB. Me too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Data. And, uh, for example, there was there were some problems with uh, joins in there. And in Oracle da Database, there were some hints uh, where you could specify uh, the order of joins. Okay. Uh, do you consider uh, implementing some kind of hints? Well, this is easy because we don't support joins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know you're here. Asking. So you can hint an index to a query, and if you and you can do that now. You've been able to do that for a while. So if you give a hint, it's actually not a hint. It's more like a command. If you say hint, use this index, 
really, it's one of those things that we probably didn't name the most obvious thing. We should have called it demand, use this index. <laughs> but I think it's traditional to call these things hints. Uh, the query will use that index, even if it's you know, going to give terrible performance. Um, 2.6 does not have a way of hinting a specific index intersection yet. So um, I'm not sure if it's just a matter of uh, being difficult to you know, provide a clean way to do it syntactically or what. Um, I believe if you hint a particular <coughs> index and, and it's an index that can be intersected with itself, we will consider that, but we won't consider any other index. So if you hit a, hint a specific index, you won't get an index intersection with, an in, with a different index. But yeah, hints, hints are, yeah, uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, the, the Postgres uh, guy's philosophy, which, which I think is a excellent kind of pure engineering philosophy, which is if a database is picking the wrong index, we need to fix the bug that you know, is preventing it from picking the right index. Uh, life sometimes is more complicated. On the other hand, you know, the thing I hate about indexes, I mean about hinting indexes, is you know, once you commit, it's there forever. It may be the very wrong hint, but you know, once it's in there, it's very hard for somebody who wasn't there when it was first added to be like, oh no, the, the hint is just making things worse, because they're like, I don't know why they put it in there, so I'm just going to leave it there, and I'm just going to try to avoid running this part of the code. So. Uh, but can you uh, hint collection of index, couple of index, and uh, Mongo choose uh, one of them, or we can hint only one index? You can only hint one index as of right now. Yeah. Uh, the other nice thing is, um, you know, before uh, you'd alluded to, you know, Mongo would cache the winning query plan. You didn't really have a way of examining that before. I mean, if you kind of knew that running an explain true would show you the previous cached one and while well, it figured out the new one. But um, we now introduced essentially an API that in the shell you can examine what the cached query plan is. And uh, well, I haven't played with it myself. I hear that you can, uh, for example, clear the cache. So let's say you reload a whole, well, you reload a whole bunch of data, it should invalidate all the caches anyway. But, uh, but there are, so there's now, commands to you know, clear, clear the cache and figure things out. From scratch. Um, let's see. Oh, let me tell you about my favorite feature. Well, so okay. Everybody has a favorite feature in MongoDB? Mine is aggregation framework. Mm -hmm. I love the aggregation framework. If you read my blog, you know I, I'm always coming up with really weird ways of using it to do something that supposedly you can't do with it. Um, the biggest problem with the aggregation framework up till now, you know, the, the return, the returned results, has to be a document. So you were limited to your result being 16 megabytes. Now, if you have a giant collection and you're aggregating to figure out something that's just like a small result, that's great. In fact, you could even get back like 10,000 things that are aggregated. But if it's more like about 40,000, then it's going to say, oh, sorry, the result is bigger than 16 meg, I can't return it to you. So starting in 2.6, that limitation is gone. And in fact, you can do one of two things, which is really cool, yes. <laughs> Yay. Yay, I didn't do it, but I'm happy they did. And I tested it a bunch. One is, um, if you don't specify anything special, you'll just get back a cursor, just like with a regular find you can iterate over the cursor and it'll get the next batch and the next batch. So no matter how big the results set, which is great. <laughs> the second thing that you can do is there's a new uh, pipeline stage that is supported. Now, it goes in the end of your pipeline. It's called dollar out. And what that does is it will write whatever comes out of the aggregation pipeline into a new collection. So you can do all kinds of aggregation transformation on your data and write it into a new collection. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Actually, so, was that uh, possible previously with the simple MapReduce? 
Well, it's Instead possible MapReduce. Instead of using the aggregation framework. An aggregation yeah. framework is so much better than MapReduce. Yeah, <laughs> and the main reason, what's the main reason why aggregation framework is so much better than MapReduce? <clears throat> What's that? It's faster. It's faster, but why is it faster? It doesn't use JavaScript. It doesn't use JavaScript. <laughs> Twice in the last couple of months, I came across somebody who was like, oh, but aggregation framework, that's just syntactic sugar on top of MapReduce, right? I'm like, what? No. The whole point is it runs on the server. All of it is like written in C++. It doesn't have to spawn off a JavaScript thread. Ser deserialize your BSON into JSON and then get it back and serialize it back into BSON and then send it to the reduce stage and then deserialize it into JSON again and then serialize it back into BSON and then by that time you have like gray hair and you're like... Uh, but yeah, you changed the uh, JavaScript engine to V8. We did. Yeah, it's mm, just a time computation there. It's, it's, it's maybe so a little faster. On, okay, maybe, maybe even if it's a little, maybe if it, even if it's a lot faster, but you know what? Okay. For 2.4, we also improved aggregation okay, framework. Yeah, it was, so yeah. I mean, it's basically about 10 times faster. 10 times? Yeah. Okay. All, my, all my tests show about, about 10 I was 10 trying to recall that 80-20 principle about the color, but okay. Oh, yeah, no. I, 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 okay. I've, done a lot of, I've done a lot of uh, tests on this, <laughs> and I mean, to me, 10x is the difference between like making a user wait for the results and not like even having an option, right? A user might wait for one second, especially if there's something else that's being shown to him. Ten seconds, that's like, oh, this page is broken, I'm gone, right? Um, now, there may still be very large aggregations that might run for multiple seconds. Great, have them run into an, another collection, and then you can be querying that as, as fast as, uh, as, you know, an ordinary query. I'm glad you know that five. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, I guess in aggregation also got a bunch of new operators. Uh, there's now set operators, which are which are kind of neat. You can do a lot of um, some of the things you can do with them. You maybe could do before, but it's now much much simpler. Um, I can't remember what else. There's a bunch of new. I don't know. It's, it's all so in the release text notes. Text search. Or what about uh, oh, yeah, text search? What about some? custom uh, operators in the aggregation framework. So, you know, <laughs> so that you could code them in JavaScript, right? Yeah, actually, we've, we've, we've had this, and, and we've, we've also okay, had this, like, where people go, well, when I do an update, can't I, can't, can't I provide, like, the update operator, like, as a JavaScript function? Or at least provide some API in C++. Yeah, yeah, well, like, what? Give me an example. I mean, uh, but uh, some complicated, uh, co for example, correlation operator about two collection, uh, about uh, attributes in the collection, two attributes, okay? Two different attributes? Yeah, sure. and it returns, for example, uh, Pearson correlation, whatever. And you can do it in C++, yeah? And but I mean, you can do any kind of math in aggregation framework. You uh, have add, kind of subtract, <laughs> multiply, and divide. Isn't everything else just a function in that? <laughs> <laughs> More or less? Yeah, it might not be very readable, but... Uh, Okay. Um, but, I mean, yeah, obviously the, the, the goal is to... Um, there's actually now support for essentially declaring a variable within the aggregation framework just so you can use it in that stage. And I was looking at them like, well, that's got to be just for readability, right? Because I'm probably in the wrong room. <laughs> and I'll, oh, whenever somebody leaves early, I always think, oh my god. I thought this was an oracle meetup. I <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't even say anything nasty about it. Actually. Um, yeah. 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 The um, so let it's, and... Uh, but it's available, uh, um, a variable, it's available only in the scope of a single uh, stage in the pipeline? Yes. Or, okay. There's also a map operator, which is kind of that you can apply a function to an entire array of values, that can be helpful for doing computation type stuff. But mm -hmm. anyway. One question about yes. the variables. Uh, how does it cooperate with sharded environments? If you perform an aggregation on a sharded uh, database collection? S yeah, so uh, s the first part of aggregation, or as much of aggregation as it can, it does on each shard, but then it has to bring them all in to a yeah. central place 
Yeah, of course, but That's been the case use of variables. So are the are they are synchronized between the shards or something like so that? So it um, they individual. actually only apply to each individual um, document, right? If they apply to some sort okay. of an aggregation, that means you're already past the stage where you have to. So, like, if you do some sort of a group and compute something across all documents, you already have to have brought sure. them in okay. into a central place. I got it. So, yeah. Uh, there's some nice things, though. Like, it used to be limited where if you were trying to use more than 5% of RAM, it would warn you. And if you're using more than 10%, it would give an error. And now uh, you can specify to it that. Uh, it's okay to use disk for external sorts, mm -hmm. and now so that it doesn't matter how much data it's trying to manipulate it, it'll, okay. it'll just use some temp But space. how much performance hit your query will get if you decide to use the external hard drive storage for sorting or mm -hmm. any... Well, it'll take longer storage. than if it errored out with not enough RAM. <laughs> 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 the nice thing about erroring out is it... it but you don't get as you know a result if it, if it errors. So I mean, it's still it's still work that's done on the server, right? Because the alternative before was essentially to bring the data in to the application, and that makes no sense because now you're also pulling all that data over the network, doing heavy lifting computation on the client, which is going to have the same problem of not having you know enough RAM for some really massive amount of data being aggregated. Um, text search. Anybody try the experimental text search feature in 2.4? Uh, so that's, it's, it's growing up in 2.6. It's, it's, it's getting its training wheels taken off and uh, it's going to be a real feature. Uh, I actually saw um, some really nice numbers. Somebody was kind of trying to do a fake text search with like regular indexes and, reg and regular expressions. You know, without using text search in like Mongo 2.4, and uh, uh, somebody in support was working with them and tried the same thing, set up the same thing, and tried it with 2.6 with text search, and it went from like several seconds to you know like I don't know 50 milliseconds or something like that. So it was something that you know if you really needed basic text search because you really can't use regular expressions and take advantage of your regular indexes, uh, whereas you know for for text search, it does stemming and kind of more of what you'd expect if you were searching for a bunch of words. And uh, if, uh, if that's what you need, it's a, it's a great, great kind of basic feature. Polish one of the languages, I suppose, for like 15 different languages. Yeah. Um, I believe Polish is one of the languages. It's yes, there's a bunch of languages in there. Other things are cursor support now, I guess all the commands. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, and it's kind of integrated into your regular. Uh, and the operators in that space as well, uh, dollar text, uh, which will integrate with the aggregation framework as well, uh, which is interesting. And, Does that mean? Oh. and the ability to, um, uh, yeah, languages stemming, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Hopefully, uh, we'll fix some bugs that existed before. You, with, with Russian the, had an embarrassing bug. <laughs> with text search, you um, typically are only able to index on a single value, but uh, there's a wildcard, so you can, te you can index on all uh, attributes with text within a, within a single within a collection. Uh, so that's kind of good, and then you kind of, like in the old version, add weightings to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, it's good. Um, what else? There's so much stuff. Security. Yeah, but that, well, nobody's interested. In <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like you know, so before it was like the things were on the database level. Now you can be on a per collection level, and then before there were a bunch of different permissions, and now you can have, custom, you can define custom permissions. So like before, if you gave somebody read write, it meant they could insert, update, remove it. You could actually create a new permission custom permission, call it whatever you want. And you could say that like somebody can insert, but they can't update or remove. Okay. Right? I mean, you know, I, I don't know. The point is that it is now completely arbitrary and unlimited, right? There's a whole set of operations and commands, and you can pick a bunch of them, give it a name, and say, okay, now that role only allows you to do these exact things. There, I mean, there are places with various rules, and whether they make sense or not, it doesn't matter because they now will be able to define whatever they want. Uh, LBAP, 
Anybody here care about them? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, many of my customers are really, yeah, really interested in security, especially those intelligence agencies and financial services customers. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> they've, been, they've been using it for a while, so uh, clearly it hasn't been stopping them. Um, the geospatial stuff. What's the name of the geospatial stuff? Uh, polygons, uh, 2D sphere indexes. That's uh, too full. There's a load of new stuff. <laughs> yeah, What's so special about this new bug operation? <laughs> Well, how Sorry, is, the how, how all the being able to send it back. Um, so the main, actually what, what most people care about the most is like, hey, is this going to make things fast? Mm -hmm. So yes, in a lot of cases, it'll make things faster just by, for example, reducing the network um, because th that's, overhead of that's, the okay, so, you know, that's not right. only a batch insert, yeah? Because that was right. okay, batch yeah. updates. Batch updates. Batch inserts were already there. Yeah. Batch inserts were already there. Yeah. 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 No, but, 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 um, so, yeah. yeah, so uh, adding the same thing for okay. updates and removes, right? But um, there's two different ways of sending a, a bulk operation and the, the technical terms for them are ordered and unordered. And ordered says, here's a bunch of operations. They, in some ways, like, are meant to be sequential, so insert or update or remove, you know, do these in order, and if one fails, then stop and tell me, okay, this one failed. Unordered says that they don't depend on each other, and you should try all of them, and then at the end, tell me which ones did not succeed. And if you think about something like a sharded system, where if I'm MongoS, and I get a whole batch of operations, and I have to do them in order, I have to send them in order, and until I hear back from a shard, I can't send any to another shard, right? And now imagine that you can now give me a batch of operations and say unordered. Just insert them as fast as you can, or update them all as fast as you can, let me know what happens. I'll divide them up so that I can send them in parallel to all the appropriate shards, and then get back the results and send back the results. That's uh, pretty, uh, gonna be pretty important uh, functionality, right? And I mean, the other thing is it's also, it's gonna allow us to hopefully uh, improve some uh, some performance in the future based on that, as opposed to the old get lost error kind of way. And like the merge chance feature, like um, it's obvious. One of my favorite. So the, if, you, if you've operated sharding, yeah. you know that there's some sharp edges in sharding. <laughs> um, so if nothing's gone wrong, sharding is awesome, but sometimes <laughs> things go wrong, right? So like you have a migration in progress. And you know, primary and one of the two shards that are you know getting the data sent from one to the other one. Let's say it goes down and failover happens. Migration has to abort. Right now, because the, the thing that kind of handles the balancing and the migration knows it didn't complete successfully, so the whole world still knows that okay, the old shard still you know has that data and officially has that chunk, but there may be documents that have been copied onto the new, the other shard, that are essentially orphaned at this point. Um, another possibility is you have a migration, and migration successfully finished, so this chunk moved over here, and now you are in the process of cleaning up the copies of those documents, right, that were on the old shard, because everybody now agreed the new shard has the documents, and when you're deleting them, something happens. You know, like again, that primary goes down, secondary takes over and the secondary is like, it doesn't get to find out that like, hey, a migration cleanup was halfway through. And so again, orphan documents can remain. And before, if there was, they caused some 
issue or just you know, like, hey, how come there's a lot more documents here than there should be or something? And you contacted support and they were like, well, here's a JavaScript a script that you can run, but you know, make sure you run it in your test environment first. And you know, what it does is it looks for like any documents that don't actually belong on this chart. And so now there's a command to do that. It's called clean up orphaned. <laughs> Right? You can only be excited about it if you've ever had to deal with cleaning up after some failures. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it's something that you know, once it's vetted to be reliably reliable, can maybe be run on the system automatically, right? Secondary becomes a primary, and then so say, hey, I'm going to run this command and make sure there's no orphans here that I have to deal with, right? That would be nice, but I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with saying that the first time the command's available, you have to you know, run it manually. Um, merge chunks is, so, everybody know how sharding works conceptually, right? You know, you, you specify a shard key, and, you know, logically, things get divided into chunks. A chunk is just a range within that shard key value. So, the assumption in the system is that because we divide chunks based on the amount of data, so this chunk now has more than 64 megs, so we divide it into two chunks. As they grow, we divide them. So theoretically, all the chunks should be more or less even, somewhere between 32 and 64 meg, if you're using the default size. So why might you have empty chunks instead? Why might there be, might there be chunks with no data in them? Mm, removal? What's that? A removal of all the elements? Removal of data, yeah. So let's say that your chunks, now oh, everybody... What's that? Pre-chunking that didn't quite work out well, right? Pre-chunk the whole space and then it turns out the data is only going into half of that space. Now you have like half of your chunks are forever empty. Uh, we had a case of somebody once who pre-chunked on an assumption of a particular data distribution but their function miscalculated the, you know, they were doing their own like a hash type value. And so they ended up with a whole bunch of chunks in a range that was never going to get any data which is kind of a problem because now the system works a lot to balance chunks and a whole bunch of them are empty. So that's a lot of work that basically doesn't do any good. Um, in general, you normally would not want to have a monotonically increasing shard key. Right? In other words, you don't want the shard key to be something that's an increasing value. Do you guys know why? Well, first, new data is coming in is always going to go into the highest chunk, the chunk that's like whatever to the max. Uh, also, if you delete older data, you end up with empty chunks. But if it's a slowly increasing, like you have a compound shard key and maybe the first part of the shard key is like year, month. All right, so it's increasing very slowly, so the current year, month might be fairly evenly distributed across the whole uh, cluster. But as you delete older data, you're going to end up with empty chunks. And the merge chunks command is one that allows you to merge an empty chunk with either another empty chunk or an adjacent chunk with data. So just uh, a way to recover from that pre-splitting um, as, you know, as old data maybe gets cleaned up to... Uh, uh, sometimes people change their shard key kind of in place dynamically and they end up essentially with you know, like a range that represents both numbers and letters, right? The old one used to have numbers, and then so they don't change the short key, they change the short key value. And so again, they might end up with a lot of chunks with no actual data. So this is just a more administrative commands to make it easier to do some things so that you don't have to mess with the config database. So that's about that. Don't mess with the config database. How are we doing on time? I don't know, how long are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> I think the idea is like 45, 50 minutes, and then you take a 5, 10 minute break, and then... You know, Still every five hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last week I was in Moscow for the meetup, and there was like over 200 people there, plus there were like a few hundred people on video, and they were asking questions over Skype and Twitter, and then I was like, yeah, you can't leave, and I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we have questions. <laughs> well, now we talk for like hours. So I think that means somebody ought to come there more often. <laughs> like, their questions were bottled up for the previous two years or something like that. Because I think two years ago was when we last time like a mom would do Um, What else? I don't know.
You guys have questions about anything else? Yeah. I want to ask about right. security, but from other perspective. And okay. It's not really related to 2.6. Uh, we all know what are the threats to SQL databases, uh, SQL injection, and things like this. Uh, can you tell us what what can happen to Mongo yep. and what we should really yeah. take care about? So I would say that the number one threat or possibility of an injection or an attack, I mean the most obvious and the simplest one is, is any kind of a denial of service right against the ports and I mean that it is what it is, right? That's no different with Mongo than with anything else. So I'll, I'll talk about the Mongo specific things, which is if you run JavaScript on the server, which I think is a bad idea, and if you take user input and you stick that into the JavaScript that you're about to run on the server, that's a bad idea. <laughs> Instead of a SQL, injection attack, it becomes a JavaScript injection attack. Except it's not like a cross-site scripting, it's more like a straight into your database script. Right? So here's an interesting and a cool option. You can start up your MongoDs with a dash dash no scripting flag, which means that you won't be able to run any JavaScript on the server. <laughs> now, you won't be able to run MapReduce, but that's okay, because you'll be running aggregation framework, and that's not <laughs> You won't be able to run dollarware, which is horrible anyway, and so I always tell people, don't forget you ever heard about dollarware. Uh, you won't be able to run root, who cares about that? So what, what other useful things will you lose if you say new dash dash no scripting? Server-side functions, those are a bad idea. Um, DB eval, terrible. Right? So you lose the ability to run things that tend to be really slow and lock up your server and also happen to be a potential security vulnerability if the input is not properly cleansed or if the input is ever comes from external source. Um, we finally figured out what it is that you will lose. Um, sh.status, that command, actually uses JavaScript to figure some stuff out. But it runs on the config server. So you can still turn off, do the no scripting option on all your actual primaries and secondaries to protect your actual data. Because config servers are just metadata, right? As long as you, you're just you're backing that up, if somebody did somehow mess it up, they wouldn't actually have access to your data because metadata doesn't actually give them access to the real data. It just tells them which shard, which range of data lives on not any particular permission to get to. So um, I do think that security is an issue. And um, one of the things that 2.6 did is change some of the defaults. Um, I'll give you the, the simplest example. When you download MongoDB package and you run MongoD, it's, oh, it's, it's definitely not secure. But it also, by default, will listen on all interfaces in 2.4. Starting in 2.6, it's only going to by default listen on local interface. And what that means is somebody who's trying to replica set for the first time and sets up primary on this machine and a secondary on that machine and tries to have them talk to each other and they're going to be like, no, I can't reach this guy, I can't reach that guy. And they're going to be like, oh no, it's broken. Right? Ease of use is compromised. Ease of use is sacrificed so that by default, your MongoDB won't accept connections from the rest of the world because it's only going to be listening on, you know, on 27001 on local host. If you want it to be listening on some external interface, you actually have to configure it that way. This is actually the default, the packages that come from, you know, whatever the, 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 the Red Hat and uh, whatever other repos that they're, they're going to have that as the default MongoDB.conf. Is, uh, so, by default, because the thing is, there's a lot of people that just never occurs to them that, oh, anybody can connect to this machine to 27017 and query my data, right? Now, they could turn on off, but if you're not listening on an external interface, then they'd have to actually you know, gain access to the <coughs> machine itself, which means they've kind of already gained access to your data. Um, 
But uh, we, we, have, uh, we have a bunch of people on the kernel team who are specifically concerned about security and who, who worry about security. And, um, so I imagine that uh, you know, you'll see probably more changes locking things down a little more tightly. That's pretty much. All right, more cheerful subject? Yeah, I have a question. Security is also depressing because, you know, it's never done, right? <laughs> you always look, you know, bad guys are always looking for ways to get in and you're always looking for more ways to keep them out, right? Yes? So when will we be able to use the geospatial uh, searching with uh, additional uh, cases? Like, I would like to search for people that are either in Krakow or they have, like, I don't know, email a particular email, because now I cannot do the or statement. So geospatial, the geospatial is part of the uh, Yeah, it is special, so I get an error. I don't know offhand. I would Too have bad. to, I would have to, well, I'm sure there's a, there's a Jira ticket for it, right? Uh, yeah, it is from it like say? a long time. So. Right, but what does it say in the target version? Uh, 2.6, probably. It was, so I can check it. I'll well, so, it. yeah, in fact, they, they just went through and cleaned up, so, like, everything says either, 2.7, because 2.6 is basically done, right? So now, maybe they moved it. So things are like either 2.7 or was it 2.7 desired? It's like 2.7 W, 2.7 desired planning bucket A, planning bucket B, and then the rest, which don't matter because they're not. I mean, you know, unless they're they suddenly become easy as a side effect of something else that gets done, right? It's a pretty big pile, right? And that's one of the hard things about being a a young product is, you know, always trying to prioritize 700 different new features that everybody wants. And every one of those, okay, maybe not every one of them, but majority of them are very valid feature requests. Okay, so what, what we're, we're trying to say that uh, no hope for having it, it like soon. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm not saying that at all because I don't know. I don't know whether the reason it's not in yet is because of some fundamental. Like, for example, it's very possible that the query engine rewrite will make it, it and 300 other things very possible and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. will just require enough manpower to get them in very quickly, right? Um, I know that there were a lot of things that were simply not possible until the rewrite happened. Um, and if you imagine that, you know, the query parser, such as it was previously, was like, Here's a basic query, and then there's a, here's a bunch of if cases. And if this is that, then you know that that doesn't scale, right? So the more complex you make it, the more fragile it would be. Um, you know, if it's written with kind of the, the broad range <coughs> of operators and types of operations in mind that we actually want to be able to support, then it becomes a lot easier to to plan to make it you know good. Hopefully. Download a play with it. File bugs, please. Because, you know, there's a lot of rewrites, so there'll be bugs. We wrote new bugs. We fixed old ones, we wrote new ones, you know. That's just how software development works, right? I was wondering why I use, don't, why still you don't have uh, out-of-the-box compression in MongoDB? Because, why don't uh, we have out-of-the-box compression? Because there are some technical obstacles, because the memory map files, but you can do it beforehand, because it would be better to have your data compressed in memory before, so before the flash happens, yeah, to the, from your end map <coughs> uh, pages. To the well, but remember that what gets flushed is what's in memory, right? Yeah. What are memory map files, right? Whatever's on disk mm -hmm. is mapped to a virtual address, yep. and then when you touch it, it has to be swapped into RAM. Mm -hmm. So you can't store something different on disk than what is in RAM. So yeah, so your data, your data are basically mm, compressed in memory and on the disk. So what's the problem here? Uh, I think the trade-off is the cost, right? Uh, I would really like to see my 24 cores on my Xeon in production to, yep. you know, so I can, more. Yeah, I can tell right you. Now it's I, all I.O. Yeah. Yeah. So I can tell you that there are kind of a couple of areas that are going to be fundamental focus of um, the next release, and they actually can probably be put under the same umbrella, <coughs> and that's concurrency. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, when, I'm surprised nobody asked about the locks. 
blocks. <laughs> but concurrency refers to kind of two things, right? One is what's the scope of the thing that you know you've locked? In other words, what what things do other things have to wait for? So reducing the scope of that is one of the goals. And the second one is how long do you hold that lock? And the faster you can do the work, the less time you're going to be holding whatever it is that your lock is protecting. So one of our goals is to make okay. better use of CPU resources to be able to perform things a lot faster. Right? Yeah, that's a good reason for that. Right? Um, my guess is that, you know, this is all kind of goes under one big umbrella. If things could be a lot faster, but they weren't compressed any, I don't think people would complain. If things took up less space, but they weren't any faster, I don't think people would complain. But at some point, you know, we have to make trade-offs and choose what to work on next. So um, how about the locks? Uh, there is still one global lock per DB. Yeah, yeah. and so one of the one of the goals for the next release is to both decrease the scope mm -hmm. of the lock and to decrease the amount of time that the lock is held. And there was work done for 2.6 that you won't be able to see, but that's fundamental to us being able to go the next step, and that is replication. There's one op lock, right? And by essentially reducing the amount of time that a lock is needed to write something to the op lock, we're making it so that reducing the lock scope in the rest of the process actually would be meaningful, because otherwise every, everything would just immediately lock on the one, you know, the shared the um, block. So some of that work has, you know, the, the, the foundation for that has already been done. And hopefully, uh, hopefully it won't take as long as this release has. <laughs> we, we tend to, every other release tends to take a bit longer than intended. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, there's, there's absolutely uh, the desire to be able to take advantage more of multi-core resources and uh, improve performance and improve concurrency and all that stuff. I can guarantee one thing though. I don't get much say about you know what actually goes into a release. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I get to vote. We get, we get Mongo bucks internally. We we get to essentially like some fake fake dollars, Mongo dollars that you get to like, you can put all of them on like one feature or like one bug, or you can like spread them out across different features. Because, you know, internally we we work with the product a lot, we talk to a lot of customers, right? And we, we get to we get to vote with our, you ever try to trade salespeople for their mom I think bucks? I voted for compression and uh, reducing the lock. For, for 2.8? You what? I think for 2.6, I think. Yeah, for two six, for two six, I put all my Mongo box on aggregation framework. I'm like, if an aggregation framework can be like like regular querying, it'll be huge, right? Because the whole thing is, you store the data the way you need it, and then later on, you want to ask a bunch more questions you didn't know you wanted to ask. And if you can't, then the data is not nearly as useful to you as if you can ask. Like, and not, not everybody wants to, you know, write a MapReduce job or, or stand up a Hadoop cluster to be able to just do a very straightforward aggregation across a lot of documents. So, so I thought aggregation framework, you know, should get a lot of effort. And for so then we, um, you were planning to introduce, you, you said, that, Daniel, that you were voting for compression feature, yeah? Compression. Well, that's, it's, that's it's, on my, based on what my customers, the interaction okay. of my customers, I get a lot of pushback about uh, disk size on disk, and yeah. uh, I think uh, it's very easy for us to say, yeah, oh, your, well, disk is really cheap. Your, your customers have money. Why, why can't they buy more disk? <laughs> well, they, they do have lots of money, but they're exceedingly tight with it, unfortunately. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah we, 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 we see that. So, um, uh, they buy it. it because it's win-win for me. It's less me me less data on. and memory. And oh, well, well, hold on, hold on. Cheap. There's different <laughs> approaches, right? I've certainly seen implementations that compress on disk, but not in RAM, right? Okay, yeah. So right, something that may be using a different storage engine or a different yeah. approach, right? So, and, and some people want that, right? They want to be able to get less disk. Some some people have been trying out uh, 
compression, you know, file systems that natively support <coughs> compression. Um, my understanding is it works really great if your working set fits in RAM, but it, the performance deteriorates very badly if uh, if your working set does not fit in RAM, like worse than <coughs> in a regular um, type of file system. Uh, about compression, uh, last year we were in uh, at MongoDB conference in Berlin. We heard about uh, uh, there was a pre they presented an idea for future releases uh, uh, to compress uh, to reduce the size of documents by uh, shortening the property names. Uh, so who's they? What is? <laughs> uh, I guess it was a presentation. On, uh, uh, which was uh, one of the last on the conference, uh, which presented yep. the future, future proposed features for MongoDB. Maybe proposed, but so here's the problem with shortening the names in the documents. I mean, you're, you're certainly welcome to do that, right? My personal feeling is readability has a lot of value, so I would never encourage somebody to use, you know, one and two character field names because you know one misunderstanding about what the field is supposed to be is pretty much makes it much less <coughs> valuable but if you think about what ram is actually used for it's, your working set is indexes and some percent of documents right indexes their size is not dependent is not related to the size of fields so the size of the document fields only matters in the actual document storage, not in the indexes. So if 90% of your RAM is being used for indexes, right, and the documents are just kind of, you know, maybe only 10% of them are being constantly pulled into RAM, how much is your actual savings from that? So that's one, that's one issue, right? The other one is, if the server somehow compressed the field names, it would then have to send the documents either with a lookup table or it would have to convert them back to having their full field names, in which case your savings is fairly minimal for something that's a pretty expensive level of overhead. Um, but actually, the, the you know, people used to be like, oh, just store a lookup table, and then when the client connects, send it you know, what your lookup is and then send a bunch of documents. Like The whole document model is each document stands on its own. There is no schema that you have to look up somewhere, right? What about replication? Replication gets a document, it needs to know, you know where to look up, but now you're actually sending this table and you're actually taking up the space that you were gonna save by compressing the fields. Um, but as far as the storage, like in RAM on the server, a, a large chunk of it is gonna be indexes. And uh, in case, I don't know, some people may not realize, in, in the indexes, we actually don't have to store the field name, just the value, since the index definition tells you which fields are being stored in it. So it's um, general compression for the thing as a whole. That would be valuable to do, right? Because that, a lot of it would compress pretty well, I suppose. Um, but specifically compressing just the field names, I think, would be probably a lot of effort for, for pretty minimal win if, if it would be win at all. Some of that is just my opinion, but, uh, but I think I'm right. <laughs> How are we doing on time? People tired? Do we need a break? Should we break? We yeah, can break. I can answer questions. If you were too shy to ask your question in front of everybody else, <laughs> just come up and ask it during the break. Or if, if, uh, if you were too shy about your English, Come up and ask me through somebody else. <laughs> also, I understand a tiny, tiny bit of color. Because I understand Russian and a lot of words. You know. Also, technical words are the same in all the languages. Like, Discovered when I was in Moscow. Like, what's the Russian okay, word? Big applause, Paul. I shall.